Um, I actually did online learning before it was really online learning in the early 90s. My husband was military. We were living in Germany and I got two master's degrees from the University of Oklahoma. But the way that they did that was to snail mail everything to us. So we would get our books and our syllabus and all that good stuff 30 days before the class. And then the professor would fly over and we would spend a week in the classroom. We would work our 40 hours. And then from six until 10, we would be in the classroom and then all day Sunday and all day Saturday. And then the professor would fly away. And again, we would use snail mail to turn in our assignments if you can imagine interlibrary loan back at that time, it was uh, a little bit of a challenge um, because there were no internet, there was no internet access to, to look up things or anything. So we made a lot of sweet bargains with family, friends and relatives um, to get that. But anyway, as, as, as I finished that program, I, uh, I did very well in a program like that, I enjoyed it. And then when I started part-time teaching, I taught for a school, um, Colorado Christian University in um, Colorado Springs, and they kind of did the same thing, but they did a more compressed, you finished everything in five weeks. But again, the students were doing almost all of their work. It was like a flipped classroom where you used the classroom time to really just engage. Um, get the students to engage with the content, um, get them to engage with you and get them to engage with each other because it was such a compressed format. And then as I got into my PhD program, I studied the history of higher education um, back to you know the 1700s, how people were gathering in houses to learn, um, correspondence courses, things like that. So this has always fascinated me. And um, when I came to UIW, um, I was always the one in our school that everybody wanted to shut up because I was always saying, well, what about blended? Why don't we think of other alternatives? Why don't we do block programs? Why don't we look at different ways to engage with students? Because not everybody likes the 16 week format. Um, I ultimately created um, with the help of my peers in the school of business, a blended, a fully blended DBA program, which now um, I think I saw Ryan Munsford. I saw his name on here somewhere. I think they are doing that either blended or um, probably fully online right now. And um, as all this was going on, I kept predicting over the years that the college campuses that we knew in the early 2000s were going to cease to exist. I just, I, I couldn't see how um, the brick and mortar 16 week come to class two or three times a week format was going to meet the characteristics of new generations. And also knowing how much higher education debt was escalating for students. I knew that more and more they were gonna have to do what I did uh, and work full time. So I really felt that schools needed to be more innovative more quickly. Um, but we had this kind of chasm for the past several decades between traditional and online format. There's always been this perception, at least in my experience, that an online environment is not as difficult or the degree is not as good. And I'm sure that just like on ground programs, there are online programs that aren't as good. But I can tell you my experience with, I work with five institutions right now. Um, my students work harder in the online classroom than they do in the in-person classroom. And I'm more engaged individually with each student than I am in the traditional classroom. Um, having said that, I will tell you to teach one class takes me about three times, three to four times as long as it does to teach a face-to-face -face course. So um, if that hasn't scared you off, I'm, gonna, I'm going to deluge you with a lot of information. I'm going to break every PowerPoint rule. I have a lot of text on a lot of slides just because there is this mountain of resources out there 
um, which is great that the resources are out there, but which is a disadvantage for you because you're overwhelmed by everything that is flying in your face. So I'm going to show you what's out there. And then I'm going to show you some things that I've discovered that work really, really well and have helped me to reduce the amount of time I'm spending trying to figure out how to engage with students. Does that sound like a plan? Sounds good. Okay, awesome. So I am going to share my screen. And I, I have been working on this up to the 11th hour, so that's why it's not at the first slide. Can everybody see my PowerPoint slide? Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, I, I captioned it online learning engagement because COVID-19 forced every traditional college in the world to go to online learning. It's, it's just, it is a way of life now. It takes six weeks to form a habit we are so far beyond six weeks. Um, this is not just a habit, it, it's a lifestyle for us. And we're seeing the resurgence of, of COVID. Um, so it seems like what I was saying in the early 2000s about college campuses really not being what they were for much longer, this seems to be turning out to be the case. Um, even now, um, UIW, Trinity, um, UT Austin, um, UT Dallas, a, a lot of the institutions that I've been kind of following have all said no face-to-face -face classes in the fall. So what we're going to talk about today is really about how to engagement. How, how do we engage? How do we engage with the student? How do we engage the students with their peers? And how do we engage the students with their content. And those of you that have been teaching in the face-to-face -face classroom for years will probably agree with me. If you asked every student in the class how many of them read their textbook, 50% of them would lie. They don't read their textbooks. They skim through them. They, they don't spend as much time in the textbook because they know they're going to come into the classroom and we're going to talk about and explain all of these concepts. So student to content engagement is really, really important. And um, UIW, what the um, Center for Teaching and Learning has done is they have, like many other institutions, focused on the community of inquiry model, which has been around um, probably since the 70s, if you think of the, all the individual little theories that have fed into this. But this is really the framework that most blended hybrid online programs use. And you can see um, the educational experience is, the, is in the center. And then in, in the top left, you have social presence, cognitive presence in the right, and teaching presence in, in the bottom. And then, of course, um, between the two at the top, you see supporting discourse. This is a form of engagement. Between social and teaching presence, you see the setting climate. This is what we do the first day we walk into a class. And then between cognitive and teaching presence, you see selecting content. If we looked at that a little different way, we could look at it in terms of the elements. So we've got social presence, cognitive, and teaching presence. If you read across, social presence is broken down into open communication. We want that back and forth. We want students to feel free. They can come to us for feedback, for assistance, for information and vice versa, we have group cohesion, that's your peer-to-peer, -peer, and then we have the personal affective. How, are, um, how is the instructor, how are the students um, bringing their identity into the classroom? And the indicators of these, if you read across, open communication is characterized by a learning climate and risk-free expression. So, for example, in one of my classes that I just finished for another university, um, it just so happened that one of the students um, uh, was gay and she got to a point where she felt like she needed to talk about that in the conversation in the classroom. And I facilitated that conversation so that she would feel um, risk-free, that she could express herself, that there was a um, atmosphere of, 
of trust. Um, another one was I had um, a gentleman who had been blind since he was 27 years old. Um, and he was participating in the classroom and didn't tell anybody that he was blind. Um, so it was affecting the communication. And so working with him to help find a way that he felt comfortable that he could share that he had this barrier. And, and again, promoting risk-free expression, um, a trusting environment so that all of the students can engage. So you can see how we read across cognitive presence um, you need a triggering event, which generates a sense of puzzlement for the student, for the participant, so that they want to learn more. Teaching presence really has a lot with how you design and organize the course. I'm going to show you a couple of examples um, of how that's done. Um, one institution completely contracts it out to program designers so the teacher gets the course already built, has no input other than the other resources. Another one, the instructor works with a design team um, to build the content. And then the third one where the instructor builds the content completely on their own. So when we talk about social presence, we're really talking about the ability of participants to identify with the community. And community, we're talking about course of study. We want them to communicate purposefully. purposefully. We want this to be a trusting environment. And we want to find a way to help these students develop interpersonal relationships. Um, and we want them to do this by projecting their individual personalities. Because in the classroom, you can see that personality, but online, you can't. Um, in teaching presence, we're talking about the design and facilitation of the class. Um, we're wanting to realize personally meaningful and um, educational and worthwhile learning outcomes. Uh, this is all centered around the facilitator. And then cognitive presence, we're talking about the extent to which, of course, um, a learner constructs their own meaning um, through sustained reflection and discourse. So when we talk about types of engagement, what it really boils down to is, are these three things, student to student, student to content, and student to instructor. And so if you think about the community of inquiry framework, the student to student is the social present, the student to content is the uh, cognitive presence, and the student to instructor is the teaching presence that we talked about. So if we take even a deeper dive into this, we still have student teacher and content. In the center now we have student engagement. This is what having a student-centered student approach is all about. So we see between student and teacher, we're fostering relationships. Between teacher and content, we're trying to identify what competencies the students need to have when they come out of the class. And between student and content, we wanna make sure that that content is relevant to them and to their, um, that they can relate it to their personal and professional experiences. Um, this is just an info slide to give you an example of how much the COI has evolved um, a gentleman named Wang created the complex adaptive blended learning system, and he expanded it beyond um, teacher learner content to include institution learning support and technology. And my guess is that this is a lot of the things that are on this are things that the UIW technology instructional technology department is talking about because all of these factors come into play and influence the learning experience. So when we create engagement in the classroom, there are some, there are some very um, easy things that uh, I do that I've learned from going through the training programs of these different universities I'm working with. And what I thought I would do is just give you kind of my top um, go-tos. So when I create an engagement for the student to instructor, I create a welcome message. I, I create a Kaltura video. It's very, very short, less than three minutes, just to kind of give them a voice that they can relate to. But then I also create a brief bio and I, I you know, I tell them about my zoo here at home, my, my three rescue dogs, my four cats, the neighbor's rescue dogs that we take care of and having 16 animals in the house over Christmas Eve, for example, um, because my husband and I are big into 
um, taking care of, of animals. Um, so you wanna personalize that welcome message and you'll be surprised how many of the students then send you pictures of their loved ones or their pets or whatever. Um, next for student to student engagement, in the online learning classroom, invariably you're going to have a discussion forum probably every week. And the assignment is usually create an initial discussion and then respond to at least two of your peers. I'm gonna age myself now. Typically the response that you read to a peer is the Dick Clark, it's got a good beat and I can dance to it, right? It's just, wow, thank you for a great post. But, but they don't really do anything to extend the conversation. So um, at one, uh, in one of the training sessions I went to, I learned about the ABC protocol for discussions. And what that means is for every um, reply that a student makes to another student's initial post, they need to inc include three dimensions. They need to acknowledge that person's content they need to build upon that person's content and they can do that in a variety of ways. They can compare it to their own experience. They can give their own thoughts on it. Um, they can pose open-ended questions. Um, but then they have to close that loop by making a contribution to what that initial post says. And that contribution can be a provocative question, um, maybe asking something about how the student arrived at conclusions that they put in their initial post or whether they, uh, what alternatives they considered, something like that. Just not a um, question that requires a dichotomous yes, no response. Or, and this is my preference because I work with graduate students, I want them to bring in external resources that they support with APA citations and references because even in their discussions, I want them to be, be thinking about the value of research. Um, I, I want them to be discovering, um, they can even contribute YouTubes or TEDx talks, or uh, you know, if they can find a provocative article online about something that's going on, maybe they find an article from the CDC. Um, my communication class is, is talking about how COVID has changed the way that we communicate. So there are there, there's just a wealth of resources out there. And then it makes it easier to grade engagement because all you do is look for the three, the ABC and the discussion reply post. When we're talking about student to content, um, the biggest lesson that I've learned from this is that it's really important from a design standpoint that you create a balanced workload. And by this, I mean no more than one discussion per week. Um, some of the schools that I teach for have more than 30 students in the classroom. For me to be engaged and respond to every initial post discussion and then read every response post and then go back and grade all of those, these are the things that multiply the time that you are spending. Plus, when you have that many students, um, the students are in the same boat that you are. They're getting tired of reading through everybody's replies. And so, the amount of student content engagement diminishes the bigger the class is. Um, it also impacts the student to student engagement. So you want to, um, a general semester rule of thumb when designing an online course is to have one discussion a week that has probing questions into the content and then three key assignments that are uh, spaced out over the term and if you take it a step further, the assignments, if you have something that builds one upon the other. So one course design that I work with has uh, what they call milestone assignments. So they're assigned a case at the beginning of the semester and then their first assignment coincides with content that we're covering and they have to give the background um, and bring in relative, uh, relevant socioeconomic political information. So then the, th the second milestone, they have to expand that paper and add one more content. So it's um, a constructivist approach to do it that way. But student content, in order for students to be engaged in their content, you really have to have a balanced workload so that they're not spending so much time typing that they're not reading and they're not relating. Um, in terms of student instructor engagement, um, feedback. 
feedback. It has to be feedback, whether it's by email, whether it's by telephone. In your grading, if you're using rubrics, UIW, um, the Blackboard um, platform has an option where you can show the feedback when you open up the rubric. My rule of thumb is that at least, at least one block in the rubric has to have formative feedback in it. And if I have feedback that could be considered um, negative, so let's say, for instance, there's a, there's a lot of grammar and punctuation errors in the post. So I will, I will start, I will use my persuasive speech training and I will say something positive about what they've done. And then I will say, to take it to the next level, consider using a free tool like Grammarly.com to submit your comment to and catch these minor grammar and punctuation issues. So I always try to um, be positive in my approach to my formative feedback. And I always try to provide feedback in every rubric and so that I'm not just checking boxes because in an online environment, students can't see you. It's really important that they have acknowledgement that you're reading what they're putting um, in there. So for example, if one of the blocks is about critical thinking, I will actually choose something from the content of their discussion and use it as an example of how they were demonstrating, demonstrating critical thinking so they don't think that I'm just, you know, skimming over stuff and giving it. Um, another way of adding student instructor and student to student engagement, which I am a complete fan of is doing what we're doing right now, the Zoom. So for one of the institutions I teach at, all I do is mentor dissertation students. And um, so they have a 10 week session, several 10 week sessions during the year. And the institution requires us to um, communicate with every student we mentor at least once per week. One of the things I've discovered in students who are taking online doctoral degrees is there's an extremely high ABD rate. They drop out of the dissertation because they have no engagement whatsoever once they're on their own. So every Sunday night at 6 p.m. I have a voluntary Zoom call. And what I've discovered is every one of my dissertation students, regardless of what discipline, calls into this Zoom call on Sunday nights and a lot of times it's, it's nothing more than offering support for each other. It's comparing notes. I had this experience. I can't find this. Uh, you know, what do you mean I have to um, have support for my sampling design? So it, it's a more of a collaborative. So I've, I've done the Zoom thing in several of my classes just as a one hour, once a week, once every other week. And it has increased the student success, the continuation, the dropout rate has reduced dramatically. So I, um, I hope that's helpful. Um, it's, it's important to remember that students in an online classroom are just as capable of hiding in the back row of the classroom. So if you are noting students who are not um, checking into the classroom, who aren't doing many posts, it's really, really important to reach out to those students, um, especially early on. If, 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 there, if there's no way that they're going to finish the class successfully, it's really important to help them to withdraw in time um, because otherwise they will just build up um, failing grades on their transcript. Um, student faculty engagement of course includes providing feedback on everything. You wanna participate in discussion forums. You wanna send frequent announcements. Um, I do um, for my Blackboard course for UIW, I do at least one announcement every Monday morning for one of the other institutions I teach for, they require a Monday, Wednesday, and Sunday announcement. <clears throat> Another institution doesn't require any. So um, the announcements are good nudges for the students. Um, it's important to provide online or telephone office hours. Um, this, I'm, I'm, I'm a little on the fence about. What I have discovered is most of the students are working full time. With COVID, they're also homeschooling their kids. So it doesn't matter if you have office hours, they need for you to be available when they're available. So I usually just have a comment um, somewhere on, 
um, the site that says online or telephone office hours can be scheduled at your convenience. Um, and then make sure you mentor individual learners who seem like they are struggling, but also mentor individual learners who seem like they are exceptional because you want to encourage those students to um, keep going. And then there's also working with small groups of students if you assign them to teach per, uh, portions of the course. But I'll be honest about this one. Um, I have not had as much success in the online environment helping students teach portions as I have in the face-to-face -face environment. So if anybody wants, wants to send me their thoughts on that, <laughs> I would greatly appreciate it. Um, in, the, um, in asserting your social presence, it's important whether it's in a rubric or an email or in a reply to a discussion post, always address the student by name. Um, express some occasional humor and passion and compassion. As I said before, share a profile and personal story. Um, as you're going through the discussion topics, um, share some personal experiences and insights. It helps them know that you're human and you're experiencing some of the same things they are. Make sure you provide prompt, timely, and frequent feedback. Um, one of the institutions I'm at requires a 24-hour response to all messages or emails and a seven-day turnaround time on all assignments. Um, another institution requires that any assignments not turned in by Wednesday, a zero has to be entered into the gradebook, and they have team leads that look at this. So there are a lot of different approaches to this, but the bottom line is the prompt, timely, and frequent feedback to emails and forum questions is really, really critical. And then always make sure you begin your course on a friendly, warm note, whether that's a, um, a Kaltura video or um, a video clip or um, a bio with a personal experience in it. Engaged students are more likely to achieve academically, attend, and stay in school. This is even more true in the online environment, so it's really, really important to focus on engagement. Give them a reason to want to come back to the course site. Um, I do that by posting um, little video clips, you know, something humorous each week that's tied to the com um, content. And if I can sense in the discussion posts that there's a little bit of frustration with the con content. I will add another announcement or I will, I will send another video or I will do something to let them know that I'm, I'm there, I'm present, and I'm willing to answer questions that they have. Um, student to student engagement here, we're talking about group projects, case studies, peer instruction, role playing. playing. I have used the asynchronous debate option in a discussion forum, and that has worked really, really well. Um, collaborative brainstorming, that works. And then I have here um, um, a website for Canvas tools that um, you can go to if you want. I will tell you, Canvas is an incredible site to have. There are a lot of free courses um, that are helpful in online teaching. And there are several online courses that are free in terms of the discipline, if you need any refreshers. Thanks for the Canvas commercial. Yeah, I, I hear that we're, we're transitioning to Canvas and I'm really, really happy because I have taught on Blackboard, Moodle, Brightspace, um, Canvas, I think there are two others. And bar none, Canvas is my favorite. It's the easiest to work with Blackboard for me, this is my personal opinion, is very clunky and very um, difficult to work with. So, and I'm a geek, I can figure out most anything. Um, again, that's just me. I'm glad we're going to, to Canvas. So um, in online discussions, um, if appropriate, you can do collaborative group discussions. I have done this in a couple of classes. It really takes detailed instruction and um, a lot of facilitation. When the students are taken out of a full class discussion and broken up into groups and discussions, it seems to create some disconnect. Um, so 
So I'm still working on perfecting that. I will tell you, it takes a, a lot more monitoring. You have to be more interactive. Um, urge students to contribute discussions throughout the week. Uh, what most of the institutions I'm at do, and you'll see this on the sample I'm gonna show you, the initial forum post is due on Wednesday by 11.59 p.m. Central Time. You have to put the time zone. And the reply discussions are due by Sunday at 11 p.m. Central Time. And the rubric, rubric for discussion forums has a timeliness um, section that you can mark off. Um, just encourage the students to post their initial discussions as early as possible. And there are some things that you can do that um, will help them to do this and I'll show you some examples and then contribute to discussions when appropriate because remember you want that teaching presence that social presence and that cognitive presence in there and you also want to model um, professional behavior ethical behavior um, there are a lot of discussions there are a lot of events going on in society right now that call us to be um, even more um, cognizant of the example that we set. I'm sorry, that's my Bella barking. Um, so it's, it's really, really important that you're modeling in the discussions. Now, some people think that you should participate in every discussion. If you have five students in the classroom, that you can do that, that's fine. You have time to do that. If you have 10 to 15 students in the classroom, that's still manageable, but it gets a little bit more difficult. If you have 30 students in the classroom, it can't be done unless you want to spend 10 hours a day on the computer. And I know that none of you want to do that. So um, a rule of thumb is to respond to at least 20% of all discussion posts each week. And then just make sure that you're not responding to the same students every week. Because again, this goes to student instructor engagement. If, a, if one of the students in the class realizes they never get a response to their discussions from you, they're going to feel like you don't care about them. So, so you have to be really um, careful that you are being egalitarian in the attention that you give in the form of responding to discussions. And then, um, of course, monitor them and encourage non-participating students to engage. And then um, it's a, a good idea at the end of the week to do a closing announcement that says, here are some things that I noticed kept recurring in the discussion. One of the things that I do because I require them to bring in APA citations and references is I'll go in and I'll assemble all of the resources that the different students brought into the discussions. And on Sunday, I'll post an announcement and say, here are the helpful resources that everybody, and I'll have it in APA format so that then they can use it in their final assignment. Um, because I typically have a paper that is due. So that's also a great way of getting students involved um, in the course development process because they are bringing information that they are researching. And then student content engagement, um, by engaging them in the learning process, like bringing resources in, it increases their attention and focus. It motivates them to practice higher level critical thinking skills and um, it also promotes meaningful learning experiences. What I have found is that it builds their confidence. Um, a lot of students, especially at the beginning of the master's level process, don't have the confidence that what they've experienced or what they're reading is um, good enough. And so I, I, I always want to encourage them to bring them in that um, to help them to build their confidence that, that what they are contributing has value. Um, and I use the term value and value add a lot, um, especially in my formative feedback. So student content engagement can include tutorials, quizzes. I use quizzes a lot. Web quests, I love those. Uh, reading or video discussion or reflections. Um, there's a recommend out, re recommendation out there that it's good to have at least one reflection assignment sometime during the course of the term so that students can give feedback on how the course is working for them, how their learning is going, what's working in the LMS, what's not working, what content um, is working, just something to help them to know that their contribution is important. 
Um, and then there are a lot of sites out there now that you can do simulations. I just received an email from Harvard Business Review of some simulations um, for developing personal values, things of that nature. So there's lots of tools out there. So to kind of recap here, um, when you're, if you're creating your own course, the way to design your teaching presence is to use a variety of formative assessments, discussion boards, um, quizzes, assignments. Um, I even have my students create PowerPoint presentation um, analyses of cases so that I can give them feedback not only on their design capabilities, but on their ability to address the key um, topics that I want them to address and their ability to analyze a case. Um, try to begin each week or module with a brief commentary on the topic. Um, share a personal experience. Bella. I'm sorry. Um, and at the end of the week, provide a transition to the next week or module. Um, periodically offer progress reports to students because even though they're looking at the grade book, um, remember they don't have that face-to-face um, -face connection. They can't come up to you at the end of the class and say, you know, how do you think I'm doing? We've all had this. There is always that student who wants to know, how am I doing? How did I do in my presentation? Am I gonna make it in this class? Um, create some podcasts or some screencasts. Um, you know, I'll post a picture of one of my pets for the week and, and just have a little conversation. You know, some people don't like to have a video of themselves done or to be seen on screen. And so, you know, just do a screen capture of something or, or you can talk through a PowerPoint if you want. Um, encourage students to bring their own experiences in. We want them to apply theory to practice. And it's easier to do that in the online classroom than sometimes in the face-to-face. -face. Encourage them to engage and contribute. And then um, most importantly, specify both in your syllabus and on the website how you're going to communicate with them and how promptly they can expect a response. And this is a quality matters um, biggie, um, this importance of being able to connect for your students to be able to connect with you. So one of the um, schools that I designed a course for and taught this spring um, was about digital culture and it was for doctoral students. And it was the most amazing class because the class started a week after the US went into quarantine for COVID-19. So we were talking all about the digital culture and what that means, and we were living the pandemic. This was an amazing experience. So I had to redesign my course on the fly because of what was going on in the country. So not only was it an interesting topic, but I also had, um, I had the experience of it happening during a historic event. Um, that impacted us economically, socially, um, and provided great discussion. So um, in a nutshell, five tips that I learned from TU is that encourage collaboration and cooperation throughout the, throughout the term, social presence. As you're answering one student's discussion, you can say, um, you know, Jim also commented on this and he suggested this. So you can actually foster collaboration, cooperation by mentioning um, other discussion posts when you're responding to one. Make sure you provide prompt formative feedback with your teacher presence. Encourage self-assessment and self-checks. Um, use your rubrics and your checklist. I encourage you to put formative feedback in at least one, um, but better yet two or more blocks on the rubric because the student really um, needs that um, verbal feedback encourage your students to reflect, and then always provide summaries and previews of each module. This takes the place of being in a classroom and um, discussing it. So I'm gonna take you to my class real quick here, just to show you how I have done some of these. So, okay, so um, are you able to see my Blackboard course? 
or are you still looking at my PowerPoint? Still the PowerPoint. Okay, so I think I have to go back to share. And um, I'm going to share my screen so that'll make it do both of them. Okay. Now, do you see a Blackboard course? Yes. Okay, perfect. So you can see here today, um, um, I, I read one of my students' initial discussion posts yesterday, and the student is an athlete, and we're talking about power and politics. And when I read her discussion post, it reminded me of this film clip um, from a movie called Remember the Titans, where Denzel Washington has them run to the site of Gettysburg. And I thought that this video clip was relevant because it relates so much to what's going on in our society. So that's an example of an impromptu announcement. But here you can see, welcome to week seven. Okay, we're in 100 degree temperatures in Texas. If you weren't already worn out from all the reading and writing, so I'm trying to add some compassion and some humor in there. Surely um, the heat is taxing your nerves. So if you need a few chuckles and some examples of organizational behavior, enjoy. And so Madagascar is one of my, fun, my favorite series of movies. They have great examples of what goes on in our organizations. And then I close by saying, if you have not completed the second case study, please be sure to do so this week, or if you miss the window for the quiz. So I, I use my beginning of the week announcements to, they're very brief as you can see, but I try to accomplish a few things. Welcome to the week. Um, don't give up yet. Here's something funny. Here's a reminder if you haven't caught up. And um, if you missed something, you haven't missed it completely. And I always close with, as always, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions. So um, my very first announcement on this page was to instruct the students to go to the Start Here tab. And of course, under the Start Here tab, I have my welcome message. Um, we have the orientation and all of that. And then um, I tell them to go to the syllabus and outline, um, which is next. And you all know this. And then after going through the syllabus and light and outline, go to the about your instructor. So you can see here, um, I chose a photo that I, I thought would be welcoming. That would convey an open communication style. And I put my teaching philosophy in there. Um, I tell them straight up, I believe students come to my classroom expecting a quality experience. So I'm, I'm just kind of setting the stage so that they know what my expectations are in the classroom. But then I follow that. I love teaching because I can give back to current and future students what my family mentors and teachers gave me throughout my life. So I'm, I'm saying something to try to connect with them and tell them I, I know what it's like to be in their shoes. Um, and then um, I have my office hours by virtual appointment and Craven at UIWTX. So beyond that, I keep my site very clean and very consistent. So all they have to do is go to the weekly modules and scroll down and you'll say week one, here's what we're gonna discuss this week. Our learning goals for this week um, for the first week, we're just to network and just discuss the nature of the content. The key topics are this, and um, the content that we're going to cover is chapter one of the textbook. By Wednesday, I love these green banners, and I've had so many students tell me that they appreciate this because it just screams at them. By Wednesday at 11.55 p.m., I have to have this done. And then, so I have post an introduction to the Activity 1.1 forum and then complete activity 1.2 discussion. So the first week is my only exception to the one discussion rule because you have the introduction and then you want them to start talking about the content right away. Then you can see I have by Sunday, post at least two responses and then the wrap up final week, by the end of week one, here's their checklist. This is what you should have done. You can see as I go into week two, now I'm expanding it a little bit now I'm talking about the topic. Diversity is a, an especially hot topic in the current U.S. climate. So I'm talking about this is what the content, this is what our discussion is about this week. Again, this week's learning, learning goals, the key topics for the week. Now by Wednesday, I don't want them just to read the 
course chapters, I need to somehow replace what I would be giving them if I were in the classroom with them. So I found um, a Pew study on um, diversity, racial and ethnic diversity. I found a Simon Sinek um, YouTube on diversity and team performance and a TEDx on how leaders inspire action. Again, by Wednesday, this is what you have done. By Sunday, this is what you have done. And the wrap up. As we get into week three, you'll see that I have last week, you discussed how diversity. So I always do a, here's what we did. Here's what we're gonna do. And, and my modules just go straight down the page. So the students only ever have to, um, and you can see as I get to week four, now the intro is getting larger because we're, we're, we're taking a constructivist approach. We're building upon what we've already learned. And so hopefully you'll, you're learning more, so you're reviewing more. Um, but again, the same format um, all the way down. So now the students have only really done um, three clicks, or, or four, I'm sorry, they've done the start here, the syllabus and the outline, the about your instructor, and the weekly modules. Those are their four clicks for the first week of class. The second and subsequent week of classes, all they have to do is click on the weekly modules. And, and within my doc document, I tell them what they have to click on in order to get to the discussion post or the assignment. So I keep it just as simple as I possibly can. So I am 50 minutes into this. I, I can show you some other examples, but I've been rambling a lot. Um, so I, I, Adela, I think maybe I should give time in case somebody has questions. Um, there are a couple of questions. Um, everyone wants to know if you'll share your PowerPoint. Mm, absolutely. I will email that to you. Um, I finished it literally seconds before I started talking to you. Well, some of us work best under pressure. I know, right, right. But there are just so many great resources um, to share with you. Um, uh, and in line with that, I want to encourage the very last slide goes to this page top hat and click on this line, click on this ultimate guide to online teaching. You have to, you know, you have to tell them your name and, and where you work. It's a 50 page guide. It's got, it's got all of this stuff in it and then more resources, but it's very, very user friendly. Thanks. Um, I have a question for you. Um, Annette, I, I've been teaching online for over 15 years, and I couldn't agree more with everything you said. It was a great presentation. Thank um, you. And one of the things that I recently came across with, and it was a new experience for me, was a student, um, and I it was uh, at another university, and we were using Canvas, and so I was always monitoring the uh, period of time that the students are in the modules or in the quizzes or discussion pages or anything else so I can can see how well they're participating um, and actually how much time they're spending and I came across a, t a student that really wasn't spending that much time and as you said I I reached out to her to try to find out long story short um, she had been in a stalking situation that who in which she was actually attacked uh, eventually. Um, oh, and as such, she was reluctant to, she wanted to complete her, her college, but she was afraid to go into classroom, a face-to-face -face situation. And so she was doing all of her learning online. And she was very reluctant for obvious reasons to, um, she was actually using a, a, a pseudonym for her name, um, wasn't her real name. And she was reluctant to, to actually put in her experiences. And I'd wondered if you had ever come across a situation like that in the discussions of trying to get students to open up a little more and talk when this one was definitely not going to say anything because of her fear of being identified. Yeah. Um, interestingly, I, I had a student that was um, not quite that drastic, but almost this student ended up living out of her car. Um, and so she, she had no internet access. Um, I think she was even pregnant at the time. And so a, a, a couple of weeks had gone by where I, I, I couldn't reach her at all and, and she resurfaced. And when she resurfaced, I was able to put her in contact with um, support services um, at this particular university and they were able to work with her. 
um, the, the problem is, you know, as you said, that, that student has a fear for their identity. How, how can you make them feel comfortable when they're worried constantly? I'm, I'm not sure that you can. I think, I think that scenario is no different than a face-to-face -face scenario. That individual needs student support beyond what we can do in the classroom. And the most we can do is suggest um, here are the student resources that might be helpful to you. In, in this situation, that's one of the things I did. You know, unfortunately, she was, this was a class being offered through uh, Pensacola, the University of West Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and she actually was out in Oregon. Um, and, and so university resources really didn't apply. She could talk to them with Zooms, um, but for more one-on-one, face-to-face -on -one, -face counseling, it was, it got to be a little more problematic. Um, oh. She eventually was, <laughs> was identified a counselor there and mm -hmm. was able to, to, to work through it. But um, I, I guess that's one of the new, new things that within online learning with students being able to be anywhere in the world. Um, right. Class that right. You know, is trying to identify what resources may be available to them at their locations. Yeah. Now, um, COVID has impacted that tremendously as well because um, psychologists and counselors um, for a long period of time could not meet people face to face. So they were doing a lot of virtual counseling. And in fact, that's what the institution I was working at did, did virtual counseling with a student and help work through it. But, you know, Institutions are in such different um, stages of progression, um, trying to figure out what kind of student support needs to be there and um, how they can help students. So I imagine the situation you just described, we'll see more of those, um, but COVID is gonna help us be more prepared to respond to them. Thank you. Any other questions, Adela? Um, let's see. <clears throat> um, a question about attendance, but that doesn't really happen in online courses. Um, the, the thing I will say about attendance is you're just like in a face face class, you're going to have the last minute student, the one that does their final paper the night before it's due, the one that studies for the exam the night before it's due. And the beauty of the online environment is you can tell by going into the course diagnostics how frequently a student is going in and out of the classroom. And I, so I, I do this at least once or twice a week. And um, an example of how this was instrumental to me was at the about six weeks into the COVID, a couple of my students were, um, what do you call it, um, not active duty, but reserve and they got called back to duty immediately. And it was only by looking at what had happened to their attendance and then reaching out to them that we were able to figure out what was going on and then make accommodations for those students because that was beyond their control. But it is, it is a, to me, it's, it's, a, it's important to look at attendance in the online classroom, see how frequently they're coming in, especially if they're falling behind um, because you can catch those back row people easier. So we also had a question about managing student engagement when your class is about 100 students. So uh, whoever that is, I'm going to say a lot of prayers for you because um, just having a class with 30 students that is very um, uh, conceptual oriented where they're writing a lot of papers. I, I, I can't even imagine how you would manage uh, an online classroom with 100 students, unless it was a class where you were teaching them faith, basic math principles or, yeah, I, I, I can't even envision doing that. Well, um, here we just finished a, a month long um, course in flipping a uh -huh. classroom and mm -hmm. there were uh, about 90 students 
and mm -hmm. five instructors. So we uh, put everyone in groups and have them do some discussions and file exchange that way. And then um, we divided them up for grading purposes because, you know, they wrote so much and, you know, had other uh, tests and whatnot. And it was, it was just so much more grading than we oh, thought when, okay. we were, when we were uh, creating the class. You, um, there, you cannot be as formative as you need to be in the online classroom when you have more than 30 students. It's, it's just, I, when I teach the, I teach this course twice a year with 30 students in it. I know I spend 20 hours a week at least on that class. And so if you're a full-time instructor and you're teaching three to four classes and you have 30 students in each, well, that's a hundred hours. I mean, that's a lot of reading and you had, and let me tell you, formative feedback can get quite repetitive after a while. I mean, how many new comments can you come up with to say you're demonstrating critical thinking? Um, it just makes you less effective as an instructor if you've got that kind of overload. So you're right, if, if I had 100 students, I would do exactly what you all did. I would, I would break it up, I would have five instructors. I would break it into groups so that the instructors could then talk to each other about what were commonalities, what were issues, um, yeah. and make the workload manageable. Mm -hmm. Most of the health profession schools have classes that big. Yeah, that's just, wow, can't even imagine. Anything, anything else I can answer? I see Laura Munoz. Hi, Laura. I see Gil Hinojosa. I recognize a lot of faces. Wow, Lourdes, haven't seen Lourdes in a long time. I see Ryan Lunsford, Terry Lopez. Wow, this is so cool. Yeah, it's a home week. Although I gotta tell you, I am not regretting being retired because let me tell you what my day was like today. Well, you seem to be doing a lot of work for a retired. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I got this down to a science. So I, I teach one, maybe two classes per term, but I get up in the morning without an alarm clock. Usually my puppies are licking my face to wake me up. I spend an hour doing an exercise of choice. I have a leisurely breakfast. I read a book on my back porch, which looks out onto this beautiful grove of trees. And then today I went over to my neighbors and went swimming for a while because it's got awful hot outside. And now I have the pleasure of talking to you all. And so then tonight from four until seven, I will dedicate that block to being online um, on my couch that has a recliner on it with my feet up and my puppy next to me. I'm telling you, it's the life to have. Well, that's great. Uh, any more questions? Well, thank you so much, Annette. And we're looking forward to getting your PowerPoint, it was certainly chock full of good information. Yeah, I will send that to you um, by email just as soon as I get off the call. Okay. And any anybody can reach out to me. I'm craven at uiwtx.edu. Love to hear from you. If you have any questions, if I can offer any support or resources, please let me know. I'm happy to do it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>